morning, good day, and uh, good evening, everyone, wherever you are. My name is Francis Gesquier. I'm the practice manager for the Urban Development Practice Group at the World Bank in the East Asia region. And it's my privilege to welcome everyone to the 18th edition of the Cities on the Frontline. Today, we will focus on gender inclusive cities in the context of COVID 19. Uh, Lauren will be introducing the speakers today. So I have the honor of reminding everyone of the intention of this speaker series and the ground rule for the conversation today. The purpose of these global webinars is to have an open and honest learning conversation between practitioners in cities and government and uh, partners supporting these entities. So the call are not on the rec record. We ask that you not attribute any comment made today or questions asked to the speakers unless the material are made available after the call or you have the person's express permission to do so. We are thrilled at the response uh, to this webinar with more than 400 people registered for the call uh, today. That's from uh, almost 100 countries. Uh, to facilitate the discussion and in view of the number of participants, uh, we ask that you use the Q&A function to post questions. The Q&A function is at the bottom of your screen. Um, please note that the recording of this session, as well as the PowerPoint presentation and additional material, will be posted online next Monday. Thank you for attending. Lauren, the screen is yours. Thank you, Francis. And I'm also thrilled to be hosting today such an important topic on how we really build back better in this resilient recovery from COVID-19 to make our cities more gender inclusive. Uh, this morning in Singapore, some of your afternoons and, and evenings, we'll be hearing from three really phenomenal women. So I will introduce each of them in the order that they will be presenting. We will first hear from Daniela Ribeiro, Barreiro. She is the deputy CRO from Salvador, one of our cities in Brazil. Daniela is holding the position of resilience manager and she helped to develop and now she's helping to implement the resilience strategy. She participates actively in our network and works very closely on the mitigation and adaptation plan for climate change for Salvador as well as circular economy initiative and very much connected to this work, working to empower women entrepreneurs through all of this work. Um, we will then hear from another city in our network. Um, we will hear going across the ocean to Hawaii from Dr. Kaloa Fox from Aloha Care in a team presentation with Keani Rollins Fernandez, who is the vice chair of the Maui City Council. So uh, Dr. Fox, is a rising young indigenous scientist, uh, a clinician and a practitioner and an advocate. She is a native Hawaiian liaison um, for Aloha Care, which is an NGO on health in Hawaii. And her programs address women's health for more than 9,000 women who are living in poverty. And she uses social determinants in her work. So we can't wait to hear more about uh, how that works and how we can apply that to resilient recovery. Um, and Keani is the vice chair of the Maui City Council, as I mentioned, um, and she holds a county council seat for Malofa's residency area. So with that, I would like to turn the screen over to Daniela to start us out. Hello, everyone. Are you all hearing me okay? Okay, perfect. So, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where in the world you are. As mentioned, my name is Daniela, and I currently hold the position of Deputy Chief CRO in the Municipality of Salvador. I've been working with the CRO agenda Compil, that some of you may know, to develop and implement the resilience strategy of Salvador. Salvador is a city of almost 3 million people in the northeast region of Brazil. It is the capital of the state of Bahia and was the first Daniela, of Daniela, yes? if you can put your microphone, I think a little bit closer to your mouth because it's coming okay. across a bit quietly. Thank you. Okay, is it better? 
Okay. So Salvador is a city of almost 3 million people in the northeast region of Brazil. It's the capital of the state of Bahia, and it was the first capital of Brazil. Our main resilience challenge in Salvador is social inequality. In 2018, 36% of the population lived with less than half a minimum wage, which is less than $100 per month. As some of you may know, Brazil is the second country in total numbers of coronavirus cases and deaths. But the incidence of the disease is unequally distributed between the states and cities in the country, as you can see in the first map. Salvador was less impacted than many other cities and capitals in, this, in Brazil. But still, on 1st July, we had 34,613 cases of coronavirus and 1,160 deaths. This represents around 1,200 cases per 100,000 inhabitants and a death rate of 3.3%. But coronavirus is affecting disproportionately more women, even though they're only, they're, they represent 53% of the population of Salvador. They are 54.3% of the cases as they are more exposed to it. Not only they represent 65% of all health workers, they are also the majority on care jobs, such as nanny maids and carers. An example is that the first person who died in Brazil of coronavirus was a maid in Rio de Janeiro whose employer had got coronavirus after traveling to Italy. In addition to the health impact, coronavirus is causing an increase in vulnerabilities and social inequalities in Salvador and around the world. Unemployment rate increased to 17.5% in the first trimester of 2020 in the city, and it hindered 64% of jobs in Bahia, leaving 554,000 people in a vulnerable situation due to unemployment or under-occupation. The informal sector, which already represented 40% of jobs in the city, was hit hardest, representing three-fourths of the jobs lost. But for women, it further aggravates their employment situation as they compose 51.7% of informal workers and they already were 53.6% of the unemployed in the city before coronavirus. It leaves them and their families in vulnerability, especially as 40% of women, our families in Brazil, in Salvador, depend on the woman's income. To worsen women's economic situation uh, and their vulnerability, domestic violence is exacerbated in the period of social isolation at home, in which victims are more exposed to aggressors and may have more difficulties in seeking help or making complaints, as they are with their aggressors 24-7. This explains why, after a 54% increase in complaints in the first months of social isolation, there was a 40% decrease in the following months. As, a difficult, as difficult to make complaint and the question of where they can go is encouraged and makes victims more afraid of seeking help. Lastly, women's well-being is also impacted. They saw an increase in workload as they are three times more responsible for unpaid care and home chores than men. In addition, 30% of families in the, the metropolitan region of Salvador are composed of single moms. They have an even harder task of balancing taking care of their kids that are now at home at the same time that they work to sustain the family. To decrease gender inequality in this context of coronavirus, Salvador adopted a series of actions. Through the Secretariat of Women, Children and Youth Policies, the Municipality of Salvador requested by a Justice Court for urgent protective measures for, both, for women victims of domestic violence to be extended during the period of social isolation, which was accepted by the court, ensuring women's safety during this period. In addition, the two municipal women's attention reference centers are now open 24 hours on call to assist and forward all demands related to women's safety and well-being that arise during the pandemic. And all services offered, such as legal, psychological, and social assistance are now being done remotely by digital channels such as WhatsApp or by their phone to ensure its continuity and at the same time ensure everyone's safety. To ensure women's well-being during the pandemic, 
Salvador also adopted a series of emergency support actions, such as the distribution of more than 200,000 basic food baskets per month to vulnerable communities and groups, including mass mothers of students of municipal schools, of children with congenital disease ca caused by the Zika virus, and of autistic children. To ensure that they can maintain their nutritional status of a during the pandemic and of affected people. It also established a monthly assistance of 270 reais per month, which is around $50, for informal workers who were left without income due to the pandemic, including the 3,500 Bayanas Jacarajé, which are those women you see in the picture. They are an iconic figure in Salvador culture who makes Jacarajé a typical fruit from Bahia and they are heavily dependent on tourism and street commerce. The municipality also developed and launched a virtual assistance to guide the population of Salvador regarding the coronavirus, informing what it is, what are the symptoms, what are the measures to avoid it. And also, it has a map with all the health equipment in the city, from hospital and local clinics to social assistance centers and mental health services. It also has an online task that anyone can take related to the person's health to know whether they have the symptoms of coronavirus and if they should look for medical assistance or not. The idea is to make health more accessible and spread information about the virus to everyone during the pandemic, avoiding people to go out of their homes unnecessarily. When planning the economic recovery of Salvador, the municipality recognizes the essential role of, role of women as they have a potential multiplier effect on the economic growth of society, known as the girl effect. It is due to the fact that women spend 90% of their earnings with their families, while men in general spend only 35%. In addition, women are usually the ones responsible for the education of their kids. A research from SEBRAE, which is the Brazilian Micro and Small Business Support Service Institution, found out that the primary reason women entrepreneurs open their open their business is because they need to have a, a source of income to ac acquire financial independence, which allows them to provide for their families and break violent cycles, generating autonomy and freedom for themselves through economic empowerment. The Resilience Office of Salvador, during the, resi during the development process of the Resilience Strategy, in partnership with Global Resilience City Networks and the Vina Foundation, carry out a study about the city's potential and vulnerabilities to increase resilience in the city through the eyes of the private sector. It showed the entrepreneurship potential of women, as well as the need to ensure inclusion and reduce gender inequality in the ICT sector, which is a potential sector for the city as it kept growing during the economic crisis of 2015, as well as during the coronavirus crisis. It generates formal jobs and has a growth potential. The study conclude that strengthening female entrepreneurship and ensuring digital inclusion strengthens the entire community, promoting income generation for families, professional formalization, and diversification of the local economy. Thus, we launched on June 2nd an impact challenge called Resilience Salvador, Women and Technology, in partnership with Global Resilience Network, Networks, Avina Foundation, and SEBRAE. We aim to select 10 resilient and innovative business led by women that combine the use of technology with solutions to make the metropolitan economy more resilient, more resilient, inclusive, and sustainable, helping to minimize the socioeconomic impact of coronavirus, contributing with the creation of jobs and income, and the economic and digital inclusion of vulnerable groups. In the first phase, the 10 selected startups will go through a training course offered by Sebrae in concepts and tools that will allow them to manage their business in a more safe and professional manner. After the course, the three businesses that have the most social impact will be selected to go through a six month specialized mentoring assistance and will receive $8,000 to implement and scale their businesses. So far, we have already received 10 initiatives, but we st we're still open until the 26th. The initiatives range from Black women's economic empowerment, trans women 
inclusion, as well as many other digital inclusion initiatives. And we're quite excited with what will come next. But we still have a long path forward, not only to our, to, towards economic and coronavirus recovery, but as well as a gender inclusive city. The strengthening of gender-specific initiatives, as well as the recognition of the different needs of each vulnerable group in the city, was a policy improvement that was strengthened in the situation. But we still need to improve communication to ensure that the information and the city's initiatives arrive to all groups and communities within the city, which also demands to overcome the challenge of digital inclusion in a city that has this huge social inequality, especially at a time when internet is becoming more and more central in our daily lives. To ensure Salvador becomes a gender inclusive city, we also need to overcome some of old gender inequalities as the pay, pay gap, which in the city has a 22% difference between men and women. The difficult for women entrepreneurs to access capital investment, the double workload that women face, as well as to develop a method of returning to work and going back to normality without excluding women as we keep schools and daycares closed in the city. So thank you everyone, and we hope to be able to answer to those challenges as we move towards a becoming a more resilient city. Thank you, Daniela. For the excellent presentation and for also sharing with us the exciting ongoing initiative and challenge in Salvador for women and technology and digital inclusion. I'm going to turn the screen and the floor over to Dr. Fox. I also wanted to let participants know we will have a polling question that's popping up for you, so look out for it in in your screen. I'll be able to respond for about five minutes. We'd love to hear from you as you're listening in. Uh, what resonates? Okay, over to you. Greetings to each and every one of you from Hawaii. My name is Kealoha Fox, the Honorable Councilwoman and I, we just want to take you virtually to our homeland here in Hawaii and we want to take you beyond the bias. Hawaii is much more than what you see on TV. Some of you might have even been here on vacation. Actually, Kapai Aina Hawaii is made up of 137 islands over 1,500 square miles, and we are a part of Papahanaumokuakea National Marine Monument, which is another 600,000 square miles. So when we talk about resilience, we're actually talking about this place that we come from as Kanaka Maoli, as indigenous people. And Kani and I, you know, before we get into our data and our recommendations and where we're going with our people in Hawaii, we really wanted to open by saying that, um, you know, to this collective of global cities, um, you're really a hub of resilience in and of yourselves, and we're just really honored to be here. We know many of you are facing difficult times. We acknowledge and honor Daniela and the work that they're doing in Brazil. These are life and death decisions. Um, and for Kani and I, we speak beyond the statistics. These are real people and um, we hear you and we see you and if there's any way that we can help to be a part of your sisterhood and uplift the great resilience work, please let us know. We wanted to begin by under, helping to understand um, and present the traditions of Mauliola. If you talk about resilience in Hawaii, it must be centering and uplifting the indigenous constructs of what that means with our spirituality, our environment, our emotional and mental connection to who we are socially as well as physically. So for us, if an individual is sick, then the family is distressed. If the land and natural environment continue to be degraded, then that's where we start to see ills across society, right? There's this reciprocity in how we are collectively really woven together, where we're not just individuals sick with one virus, we're actually a part of this greater ecosystem. This is 
very much a part of our traditional ideology and the ways in which our kupuna, our ancestors, have passed down their wisdom to us to be the stewards and leaders they need us all to be today. We talk about mana as the greatest source of Indigenous resilience for our people, and we're here to share some of the ways in which we're shifting the entire deficit paradigm, and we're focusing on equity, justice, and self-determination for Hawaii and for Kanaka Maoli as its Indigenous people. My work has been studying um, the industrial systems prior to the pandemic and in concurrent too. And so what you see here with the colorful graphic um, to your right is where we have experienced over time the bubble popping to these weakened industrial systems over time due to other infectious diseases in Hawaii's history. So this isn't new to us. Hawaii, Hawaii and Native Hawaiians in general by survival, we're actually resilient. So you'll see here the dipping of the whaling industry from the 1860s to the 1880s. At the same time, we're seeing five, six infectious disease pandemics and epidemics happening concurrently in the Hawaiian Islands to our people. What my research does is it intersects these, these sociocultural histories through a biomedical lens that also tries to underscore and not erase the disparities and inequities we're experiencing today. So for example, in Hawaii, Native Hawaiian women like me and Kiani, we are more likely to serve you coffee or make your bed in a fancy hotel room than we are likely to be in a boardroom making decisions about clean energy and investments in new economies and the types of technologies our people and these islands need to continue to survive for multiple generations. So for example, right now we know that 56% of job losses are to women. And for example, the average caregiver in Hawaii is a 62-year-old woman caring for her elderly parent or her husband while also still working. This is the type of intersectoral work that Kaani and I are doing here with our people in our communities. And I've been mapping that to the pre-COVID disparities and inequities as also the baseline. So for example, if you're a Native Hawaiian woman, you're more likely to have double the incarceration rate than any other race or ethnicity. Our Native Hawaiian girls are experiencing double use suicide attempts in secondary school, and we have the lowest life expectancy of all ethnicities in our own homeland. And so I work for a nonprofit health organization where 100% of our members live in poverty, 72% of our members are women, infants, and children. And so we're centering our gendered response through this lens to help be change agents to eliminate these disparities, which were present before the pandemic, and the pandemic has already exacerbated in just three short months here. And so this is where we are today. We understand that these rates are very low in comparison to places like Daniela has just illustrated for us. At the same time, we know that in context, the next month, two months, and three months will look very different because our state sets to reopen tourism on August 1st. And that same week, we expect to send our own children back to school. What will it look like on September 1st or October 1st? Where we know the blue lines here in this graph show that much of the positive cases in Hawaii in the early weeks were either due to travel and visitors coming into Hawaii for visiting purposes, or they were travel associated contact. And we know this now by tracing efforts. Unfortunately, we still have very low tracing like you will find in many other places, only about 8%. And so we're building culturally responsive programs. This for us is really the key. At Vivi Collective, we're talking about building resiliency hubs where it's about the community health, not just the individuals. And we strengthen the city and county of Honolulu by connecting families and coworkers and ohana. We're gonna share with you our Hawaii Feminist COVID response team comprised of over 40 women. And we have published a report that's been groundbreaking, the building bridges, not walking on backs. And I believe the link will be shared with you in the chat feature. We have illustrated some of the questions here that we've been asking of ourselves, our government officials and business leaders. We ask you to have those same questions. 
I'm going to turn it over to Kiani to talk about the legislative efforts to turn this plan into action. Mahalo kialoha and uh, as Kiala said, it's an honor to be on this panel today to share some of uh, our stories of resilience. Um, Aloha mai. Uh, I'm an Indigenous woman, and as Lauren said in the beginning, uh, I am the Maui County Council Vice Chair, Chair of the Economic Development and Budget Committee, and representative for the island of Molokai. I have my law degree specializing in Native Hawaiian law and environmental law, as well as an MBA. And most importantly, I'm a mother of two beautiful children, a 10-year-old son and a nine-year-old daughter. Uh, so as you see on the slide here, Maui County is one of the four counties in Hawaii. It comprises four islands, Maui, Molokai, Lanai, and Kaho'olawe, three of which are inhabited with a population of 167,000 people. We have a council, um, we have nine council members that are voted on by all of the residents at large, uh, but each council member resides in one of the nine districts. Our council is the legislative branch of our municipality and the administration is the executive branch. Uh, similar to what Kealoha mentioned statewide, the Mau Maui County is experiencing the same high number of uh, cases that dipped low as a result of the shutdown. Uh, and um, has, is beginning to trend back up. On Juneteenth, a uh, day celebrated as um, Freedom Day, the Maui County Council unanimously and enthusiastically passed a resolution supporting a feminist economic recovery plan, urging the administration to incorporate the recommendations of the plan that Kialoha mentioned, building bridges, not walking on back a feminist economic re recovery plan for COVID-19 as a foundation for Maui County's economic recovery. And why is this important? Um, Maui is the first county in the United States to pass feminist economic recovery legislation as a result of the amazing work uh, that the task force um, Kialoha mentioned earlier. Uh, as we know, once precedent is set, the path is forged, making it easier for others to follow. And just yesterday, our sister county unanimously passed a resolution modeled after ours. What does this resolution do? Um, it calls on us to seize this opportunity to transition our economy to one that honors everyone in our county. It calls on those who have been directly impacted to lead this charge. And it calls on us to create structural equity to fortify a new foundation moving forward. Again, as uh, Dr. Fox explained, and I'll bring up the slide, mahalo. Um, the systems created produced unemployment that disproportionately affected women and minorities. On the next slide, uh, before I go into uh, what this legislation means in practical terms, I wanted to share how this particular council was able to make this happen. Uh, this council that I have the privilege to uh, work on consists of a supermajority of women for the first time in our county's history. It consists of a supermajority of Kanaka Maoli, and all of us come from minority communities, most of which uh, we most of us uh, which grew up in the communities we now represent. As I mentioned, the, this resolution calls on, uh, on those who have been directly impacted uh, to lead the charge, which our current council body has demonstrated with this action, placing those that are directly impacted at the helm, ensuring that all further action taken authentically represents those that are impacted. Our council's current majority, uh, Kanaka and female membership is representative of what results when the community feels empowered to secure leadership representation as a voice for communities that are impacted most. While I celebrate this as a win, considering that women were not categorically subordinate to men in Hawaii prior to European contact, 
it did take quite a while for us to get to this point uh, to go through the necessary structural changes as a council to empower voices to make decisions on behalf of the communities that are directly impacted. It's important to point out that feminism is not exclusive to women. It is a theory of political, economic, and social equality for the sexes, which applies to everyone, regardless of gender or sex. When we understand that women are pillars of our economy, we understand that this plan is about serving everyone. We have overlooked women's role as an integral part of our infrastructure in the economy for far too long. So who do gender inclusive cities value? The voices of those most impacted by COVID-19, including women, girls, femme identified and non-binary people, racialized women, women of color and native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander and immigrant women in Hawaii uh, are largely missing from the discussions on the economic impact of COVID-19 and recovery planning. This visionary plan being used as a model by governments in other states uh, and in United Nations calls for the reshaping of our economy. As our counties begin receiving uh, Federal CARES Act funding, there is a glaring urgency to set prior policy prior to the distribution of these funds, which will ensure uh, women's labor will not continue to be overlooked or undervalued. Now, as the Economic Development and Budget Committee Chair, I support having a plan that we look to for guidance as a first step in filling disparity gaps in all aspects of society, between men and women and among those who face unjust discrimination, including the differently abled LGBTQIA community and racial minorities. In practical terms, uh, what does this mean for our community members? It means equality and pay. Uh, in one union where, our, um, where the unit is primarily composed of women who work as secretaries and assistants who require degrees uh, to have these positions, um, they do not receive comparable wages as men who work in labor positions who do not require uh, degrees. Um, and these women have not received raises for over eight years. In planning and design, uh, an assisted living facility for our elderly um, designed, it was designed years ago uh, for those who identify as one of the two gender binaries. In one situation uh, where uh, one of our community members went to take their elderly family member. The elderly family member um, is one who uh, identifies as mahu, uh, which is um, a, a person uh, born as um, what would be identified as a male in the two gender binaries who dresses as a female um, as the two gender binaries. And that um, person uh, did not have a, a place to go, the facility, had uh, space for women and space for men. And this community member was not allowed to uh, be included in uh, a room with a man or a room with a woman, therefore leaving this person without a place to go. This person would have had to pay out of pocket uh, for a single room to be taken care of. Um, and these are our family members. These are real people, like Kialo has said, um, left <laughs> without a service. And so as we think about those who are part of our family, um, looking forward, we must design these types of facilities with everyone in mind. And in practical terms, uh, we also need to fortify our foundation like we never have before, uh, such as uh, building the state's 
social infrastructure and promoting women's financial independence, establishing a universal single payer health care, paid family leave, and tax reform. Um, also moving away from military, tourism, and luxury development toward more sustainable livelihoods, uh, green jobs in the energy and production industry that promote uh, gender and racial equality. And in our last slide here, um, a few recommendations moving forward um, for the environmental, uh, honoring our the indigenous knowledge and nature-based solutions endemic to your area, region, geography, uh, social aspect, uh, protect and strengthen social safety net programs for the next decade. In economic terms, ensuring cities, contracts, and GIA prioritize women-owned and um, people of color-owned businesses. And in terms of health, uh, address equity by prioritizing social and cultural determinants of health among women, infants, and children. Um, and in the, the last slide, I, I wanted to go back really quick. Oh, okay. Um, in the slide before. Okay. okay. Um, and some of the values. Oh, yeah. um, so who do gender inclusive cities value? I just wanted to quickly uh, go over each of those points there. <laughs> so um, women and girls, um, bi and people of color, immigrants, domestic workers and caregivers, survivors, incarcerated, um, uh, recommending a higher wage uh, for Hawaii, $24.80, paid leave and telework, um, promoting uh, nursing and midwifery, reproductive rights, and uh, empowering our single mothers. And, and then we'll go to our, um, the last slide of the presentation. So again, um, as Kiolo has said in the beginning, we understand this is a 20 minute presentation uh, that covers years of work. And uh, you'll see our contact information on this slide. And please feel free to contact us if you would like to work together on these types of efforts. Um, we support everything that everyone is doing to uh, create their, um, promote resiliency in their cities. So, mahalo again for this opportunity to uh, present on this panel. Thank you, Kiani Kilowan. Danny, for your interesting presentation. I really appreciate, uh, Kiloa, when you say that behind statistics there are people, and yet uh, all these st statistics are really striking. In fact, one that uh, just appeared from our pool, which is also striking, is that of all the participants to this webinar, about only 11 people uh, are aware of uh, any gender action plan. Uh, to, to promote gender and, and women in their in their own cities, which is, um, uh, I think, desperately low. I think one, one question, and this is really a question for me, but I'm sure everybody has the same question, is what advice would you have to the participants on how to, how to get there? You guys now have plans who you have, uh, I, I know it probably could be more, but you, you have a feminist action plan in, in Hawaii or in your district, uh, you have um, some actions in, in Salvador. Where would you start? How would you convince the legislative and the administration uh, to to design such a plan and move forward in, in that direction? Maybe we'll start with Danny in Salvador and then move move on to Kaloa and, and Kehani. So Danny, uh, the floor is yours. Um, I think it's a long path that we also came. Uh, Salvador didn't not start taking gender initiatives from just now. So we have a department in the city that focused on um, women's policies, and we have many other departments in the city that are doing um, transversal work considering women's needs when working. But I think it's years and years of 
raising awareness about the need to have a gender specific lens when you think about public policy, as well as making everyone understand the important role women play in society, both their economic role as well as the pillar they represent for their family and for their communities. Um, we have a partnership with a university here that is empowering um, local women from vulnerable communities, and they are studying how, by empowering them, they replicate the knowledge they receive in the university to many other members in the city. So it's it's quite interesting to to know and to understand that as more people become aware of the importance of women in society, more policies and more plans for gender equality cities are created and start happening. Aloha, you want to take over? Thank you, uh, Annie. Yes, um, thank you, Francis, and and I agree with um, Daniela in in empowering communities and neighborhoods. I also believe in empowering all organizations and institutions to start these plans. We don't have to wait for cities and governments or legislative bodies to do it for us. Um, and really, that's the work that's happening here in Hawaii. It started with community mobilization. It's really a grassroots effort. And luckily, we have champions and we have community members that have been elected into seats of legislative powers, like the Honorable Councilwoman here, where she actively is listening to our community concerns. And the entire body has been receptive to understanding the data as facts and it has been welcomed um, with these solutions. So I think everybody has an opportunity to make a plan wherever they're at and hopefully has the ability to um, have a seat at the decision-making table, which is where we need to really focus our efforts next, at least in Hawaii. Yeah, hi, any additional comments? Mahalo. Um, I'll echo what uh, Danny and uh, Dr. Fox uh, stated. Um, it does take years, um, but I think as, as we say um, here in Hawaii, you know, we, we stand on the shoulders of our ancestors. And people like Dr. Fox, uh, who worked really hard uh, in this task, task force to put together a plan like this, um, you know, other places won't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, they can take some of the work that's already been done and other municipalities can point to our municipality as leading the way, that this isn't something foreign uh, and no longer is it new. Uh, Maui County was the first. Hawaii County just passed their um, feminist uh, resolution yesterday. And I think by the uh, end of this month, uh, the entire, uh, all four counties will have passed it and we're hoping that the state legislature will also um, look to support uh, this economic recovery plan. And uh, as Kielo has said, it's mobilizing the community uh, at the grassroots level and demanding that their elected officials um, take notice and um, incorporate these um, ideas that benefit everyone. I think that's uh, one of the important um, points uh, that I was trying to make in my presentation, that this isn't a woman only thing, that the entire family and therefore the entire community benefits from policies that empower women. Uh, mahalo for that question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Kayla. And thank you, Anna, for your answers. In this moment where we are socially distanced in many cases, um, maybe a, a practical question. When we want to mobilize our community, 
in particular on such an important issue. What are the kinds of tools and approaches that we can use uh, effectively to do that kind of organizing now? And, and how can we, if there are such good opportunities, how can we take advantage of the information that's coming from the pandemic or about the vulnerabilities of our communities? I think, Danny, you shared some very specific statistics about women's employment, about their vulnerability, about the invisible work that they have to deal with because they are the first, <laughs> I think as any um, parent has experienced, many times the woman is the first person to answer that call when something's not working in terms of the kids' education and school. And so what are we what are we able to capture during this time and how can we continue to organize our communities in this time of social distance and build that pathway towards organization and getting those plans into place. I don't know, if, uh, maybe I will uh, ask the Hawaii team to start this time and then we'll come back to you, Danny. So, Dr. Fox, maybe I can start with you on the statistics. What are we learning? Some cities are learning a lot. And some, unfortunately, are um, being left behind because of the information not being open source and publicly available. So, for example, Hawaii, for a couple of weeks, we did have our gender-based statistics available on the Department of Health's website. Unfortunately, the State Department took those numbers down. And so now we are unable to track the gender differences on the physical positive health cases. So that's why right now we're focused on the economic and social impacts because that's the data that we currently have access to that can be disaggregated. So one, I would first recommend that every city, every mayor, every commissioner, make sure that you have open data sources and you have platforms where community advocates, NGOs, students and academics and your constituents can get access to the information that is a part of the public forum and should be a part of the information pathway to provide good planning efforts to where do we go, not just for one month ahead, but for what we're doing in Hawaii. We're talking about 10 years of real planning for a new economy and a future. And I, I think many, much of it can start there. And I think that's where many cities and organizations and institutions can be empowered by allowing these dialogues in these forums to be open through great technology. Many of us now are able to be in more meetings than we've ever been able to be in the same room before. And so I look forward to more organizations and jurisdictions doing just that moving forward. And I'll, I'll dovetail off of um, that, Lauren, if you'd like. Um, basically, what, what Kelo has said is spot on uh, with having uh, open information, um, but also utilizing this time where we're you know, being forced to social distance um, and we seize these opportunities uh, to learn from uh, not just each other within the state, within the country, but all over the world, uh, which you know, I, I thank this effort um, in, in doing and capitalizing on. Um, our county was the first in the state of Hawaii to um, have all of our um, council meetings all online and accept live testimony uh, via audio for people to call in um, and video through the video so conferencing software. And that has been very empowering for our community because no matter where they are, uh, the county that uh, I'm part of are, are four separate islands. And uh, the decisions that are made are on an island that's separate from the island that I live on and, and my community members. So I, I think um, this opportunity of um, video conferencing has really opened up access to our elected officials and decision making. And um, you know, as we look forward to planning, uh, making sure that our, our community has that uh, input in um, opening up our schools, for example, and, uh, you know, whether it's something that is a good idea or whether we should now think outside the box and um, think through, you know, telework 
and having our children, um, you know, being homeschooled, really looking at whether the structure has been beneficial uh, for us um, or if we should really be looking at other things. Mahalo. Um, Danny, over to you. Okay. Um, about indicators and statistics, we are, I think, this is the time where we are looking at it the most, not only to see how how many people we have um, with coronavirus, what's the number of cases, what's the growth rate and or the death rate, but also to understand the differences of how it's impacting men, how it's impacting women, where in the study it's being um, it's being transmitted and where it's we have hotspots. And I think it's improvement from where we were before. We were looking to so many statistics and indicators that we can actually start, that we we start doing a lot of policies based on evidence, which I think we could apply to all types of policy, not only health policies. And I think this is something that coronavirus has taught us, the importance of statistics and indicators of on how we decide. So we are looking at indicators to decide on what phase we are we are for the open up of our society or of the how we are what can be open or what cannot be open. And at the same time, we learn to listen to people. I think the fact that we are isolated made us more open to actually listen to everyone and understand the different needs of the different groups and who um who needs a basic food basket because they don't have what to eat, and who could be helping or could have help regarding how to access credit in this time. So we we are doing policies also based on the different needs. And I think this was really important, especially when you think about gender. A lot of times policies were created based on men who were developing the policy. And when we started listening to the different groups, and the different genders, we actually include them in the development process of the policy. About communication, our mayor is doing daily lives about the coronavirus, coronavirus situation in the city, and it's being it, it proved to be a quite efficient way of communicating to people and to media and to everyone, and it's being quite helpful. Social media and WhatsApp was very useful to make communication spread fast. And we're actually looking at it as a way to spread communication. We still have a barrier of who has a phone or who has internet to be able to um, to follow all the news and all the lives, but it's more accessible than sometimes newspaper, for example. Um, we, still, we still need in-person communication in many cases, especially in more vulnerable communities, and we won't be able to to go to only digital um, methods. In in the mitigation and adaptation plan I mentioned, we are um, doing calls, phone calls to some community leaders to understand their perspective on the issue because they, they do not have internet in order to do it on Zoom meetings or online meetings. But it's important that we understand this difficult as well when we are developing a policy in order to make it inclusive, not only socially inclusive, but gender inclusive and racially inclusive. And, and I think um, coronavirus has allowed us to, to be inclusive. Thank you, Danny. Uh, I think I mean, you, you're the one who mentioned the the issue of women facing a double load, right? They have only they have to take care of children at home, but then they also have to work outside, or sometimes they have to accumulate jobs, uh, and and this much more than men. Now, in the context of or, or taking into account the fact that COVID is probably the, here to stay, and probably in in the Americas in particular, they will be returned to a period of lockdowns. Uh, there are quite a few people who are asking for concrete uh, ideas on 
or, or things you you are considering you and that's a generic term in in Hawaii as well to take care of issues like schools and daycare uh, during during uh, those periods or also issues of transportation that are specific to women if you could elaborate on those any concrete suggestion and the ideas that have emerged uh, from your work and maybe also from uh, uh, what you've seen in, in other cities I think this is a very good question from Marissa Midoski and, and from baby Shao ask have you have you observed interesting um, solution not even in your communities but also outside maybe starting with you Daniela and then moving on to uh, Keani and, and Keloa some of those answers I would love to know as well like if anyone knows um, we would be very pleased to 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 know um, regarding transportation we are looking into um, increase the number of cycle lanes in the city uh, in order to not only diminish the amount of people on public transportation which is the main transportation in the city but also as a way of increase increasing um, active active mobility but we still have the, we still face this issue of transportation Salvador did not get into lockdown into full lockdown the city never stopped we never closed all the commerce only like shopping centers and um, commerce that was more than 200 meters square but um, street street commerce was open it did diminish and they did had a big impact because most of people were staying at home um, everyone was requested to when possible to do home office so there was an impact in commerce in the economic sector our economic activity was has been very low in the past months but we did not close so what we are doing is when we are considering the opening opening um, sectors that were closed like shopping malls we're considering to allow them to open at different times in order to not create a um, not to make public transportation flu um, and, and allow the, the sectors to to rotate the different times they open and they close so public transportation will always be median median occupation um, about schools we are we won't plan we don't plan to open schools that early we are with we're doing online schooling for children and teenagers and we still don't know how to, to solve the workload for women um, we are giving all the the mothers of kids from public schools a basic food basket not only to ensure they have food but also to for those of them who may have lost income to not suffer and have to be out of their home looking for jobs or looking for income so they have a meaning a way of life but we still don't know how to solve this specific issue unfortunately maybe kehani maybe you can start this time Mahalo, Francis. Okay, so I think there's a, a lot of layers to this question, um, but uh, I think you were asking about the imbalance of workload. Um, so here in Hawaii as well, um, you know, women are the primary um, caregivers for the family, and um, which means that education uh, the responsibility of education also falls uh, upon um, the woman to ensure that our, our children uh, continue to um, have not be left behind uh, because uh, the schools are now closed um, for in my work with the um, discussions that i've had with um, those in um, in our county, uh, I know a lot of women are particularly uncomfortable um, sending their children to school at this time. Um, 
And one of the things that I hope that our state, uh, who is in charge of state, uh, our education system, uh, will work with our families. Um, I, I homeschooled my children uh, for about two years uh, prior to this pandemic. And um, on the island that I live on, uh, the families came together. Uh, those that were homeschooling uh, came together and we had a group. Um, and so that kind of uh, idea of um, creating a small group of uh, children who can learn together, whose families are comfortable um, with that type of interaction and um, having uh, schools uh, classes online uh, is, is one way um, that has proven to work. Um, I've done it, uh, as well as uh, the families um, that were in the same, um, what we call hui, <laughs> uh, group as uh, I was in. And um, for those that have the flexibility to uh, you know, work from home or work part-time from home so that they can take care of um, that uh, important job. Um. Yeah, I will expand. Um, I think both of those are great suggestions and offer concrete recommendations. Um, I like to say that I, I, I don't think that we should um, focus on this term of reopening economies. In my mind, the economies are still there and we've always been open. Women like us are still working every day. The capitalistic and industrialized notions of economies have slowed down or stopped in some sectors, but mutual aid and trading and community support and what is the very fabric of resilience in communities is still very much present and alive and is thriving through this pandemic. And I think that's something that indigenous and native and aboriginal peoples can teach around the world, right? Because we continue to live subsistently in harmony with the land in our natural environment, despite every odd against us. So for example, Chani had mentioned the ability to testify digitally and remotely now, which is something that her county was the first one to do. I, for example, was able to testify at their hearing while also simultaneously at the same time making sure that my first grader is on his science class Zoom and he's able to still participate in summer school to, so that he doesn't get stuck behind because we know our Native Hawaiian males are often left behind in STEM education. And so I don't want that for him because they made that happen women like me are allowed to civically engage where we're also still able to be caregivers and the core providers that our families and our communities need us to be. I will also provide a concrete recommendation that I think all cities and uh, businesses really should start to look into. And I would love us to get much more creative on reimbursement and um, coverage for social determinants of health and those types of interventions and prevention um, programs and services. So what would it look like if we added more um, value to um, the concept and the notion that we presented in our presentation where um, we are a part of this system, we're a part of the ec ecology, right, of, of wellness and health as a whole. What does it look like when food is medicine? And that's the first prescription that we provide to our patients and our members while we're also making sure that we're providing them the clinical and medical care that they need. What would it look like if our primary intervention is to make sure that young children and their families have a safe place to go every single night that is sheltering them from what is looking to be one of the hottest, if not the hottest summer on record so far, so that they can have a place where then they feel like they are a part of a hub and that that hub 
is creating and, and uplifting their own innate resiliency within them and the power that they already do hold. I think if we re-look at some of these terminologies of what is our value add to the communities we serve, and if we redefine what some of these reimbursement or contractual fee for services look like, I think we can really open up innovative conversations. And I don't think that we have to continue to have the primacy of our conversation start with what a reopened economy looks like, and rather it prioritizes economies that are thriving and still existing without the industries that have long oppressed people like us. Kayla, that was such a powerful way to end this session. And uh, I just want to thank you for those comments. Also to thank Kiani and Danny for theirs. I mean, this idea that it is really a systemic change, right? It's, it's addressing things in a completely different way. Um, and that there's a disruption here that if taken in an intentional recovery can really fortify communities and systems, empower women be gender inclusive. And I think we're going to need to have a follow-up session um, looking at some of these ways that we can engage um, in these innovative economic models, right, that, that are empowering these, these community-based um, recovery uh, activities where we're looking at how people are compensating community members and valuing that work. There's a lot of great work out there on that. So that's probably deserving of another session. I do want um, to keep relatively to time, and so I'm going to bring this session to a close again. I want to thank all of you for being here with us for an incredibly meaningful session. I would encourage all the participants to look at the links that we shared in the chat. We'll also be sharing these on the website along with the recording and the PowerPoint, as Francis mentioned. Next week, we are going uh, back to our Thursday evening, Singapore Thursday morning, um, U.S. and the Americas. Um, uh, timing, we will be talking about resilient housing with Elizabeth Hausler from Build Change and Santiago Uribe from the city of Medellin. So please join us. We will be focusing on how we uh, recover with resilience, in particular creating safer uh, housing for uh, low income. So please do join us. Again, thank you so much. Uh, it was wonderful to have three phenomenal women on this morning. Uh, wish you all a good evening uh, ahead of you.